Snackers. I'm Matt DiNapoli. I'm a manager of developer advocacy with Cisco DevNet. Hello, Snackers. This is Kareem Iskander. I'm a tech advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. Welcome to episode 64 of DevNet Snack Minute. DevNet Snack Minute is your 10-minute all things DevNet, giving you a quick, fun way to learn about Cisco APIs, coding. It's just some cool stuff that we do here. And uh, today we are very privileged to have one of Cisco's chief architects uh, join us and talk to us. Carlos, would you mind introducing yourself and then kind of cluing us in into what a chief architect does? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. So my name is Carlos Pereira. I've been at Cisco for almost 20 years, by, 21 years by now. I used to have hair when I joined, so that's what happens <laughs> when you go on the technology for too long. So yes, I'm a fellow inside Cisco and the chief architect. To your question, the chief architect is pretty much the one that brings the multiple architectures on the different teams together. So it's like you have heads of architecture, distinguished engineers that goes in a particular space, let's say security or infrastructure or cloud or something like that. And the chief architect brings from a technology perspective this together, includes all the dimensions of this. That's, that's pretty much the job. In, in DevNet Snack Minute and over the course of the, the life of DevNet, we always talk about how we can um, combine technologies and build these things together. So it's really fun to hear from someone who has kind of seen it all across Cisco and, and ties all of those different areas together. But um, I do know you wanted to talk about uh, FSO today, Kareem. Um, I don't know if, if you have any questions around FSO or want yeah, to get that started. Let's get the conversation going. I uh, appreciate your time, Carlos. We, you know, we wanted, we hear a lot about FSO, full stack observability. It's clearly something that we, Cisco, are doing here. It's part of our strategic pillars that we, you know, we have. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what is FSO? Yeah, I'm glad that you, you started by by defining what the acronym is. So a lot of people talk FSO, FSO, you know, it's, it's another three-letter acronym that Cisco is very strong on putting them out there. So full stack observability, just to try to define, has two aspects on this. What's observability and the motions of full stack? So let me try to decompose this. As to your question, the architect needs to get the pieces bring together. So observability is, is more of an, an evolution that exists in the industry that's going on today. And let me explain what I mean. So everybody has monitoring. So you have infrastructure monitoring, application monitoring, security monitoring. Those tools used to be reactive. So you look at what's going on. They have the dashboards and the majority of the teams used to look at this for like a, a traffic light. Is that green is good. If it's red, the typical behavior is making sure that it's not red for me, so it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. Well, Usually, network takes the blame. So that monitoring, which used to be more reactive, has evolved over time to observability, which is more a proactive thing, is more active for telemetry that you ingest. And you are able to react on that data to get some information on root cause analysis, which allows you to understand better what's going on. The point with this is that that trend on observability is becoming more pressing these days. Why? Because a lot of business are actually going digital faster and the pandemic it just boosted the timing for that to happen. And that implies that what happens like in the last decade on DevOps, which is very close to ours on the developer heart, which is what used to be skill sets that were associated with teams get converged through the DevOps motion to become automated capabilities on a pipeline. So nobody argued with that today. It's reality. So you have how DevOps works. If you look to the post-production operations on how this works today, you still have a lot of different teams, the security team, the infra team, the cloud team, the ops team, all this, that, and the other, and they still don't come together. So there's still teams with skill sets that belong to their teams, which full stack on observability, full stack will bring those teams together. So what used to be skills on the teams is going to be automated capabilities on something that will allow the post-production operations to match what the pre-production DevOps is. So the digital goes faster, which is an industry trend. So observability is evolution from monitoring to more data-driven real-time, and full stack is bringing the teams together. That's why I'm fully excited because 
to the questions, the chief architect brings all these teams together, the ingest data drive insights so we can trigger actions that are more real time and more realistic to how the, move, the movement on the market is going. So hoping to answer your question. Yeah, it totally right. did. And I like how you broke it down because, um, you know, I we talk about it a lot, but it's cool to hear how um, we would split these things apart. And really, the interesting part of that is the bringing the teams together portion. It's a notion that we've been talking about for uh, at least in my time in DevNet for eight, eight years or so. I know it's a conversation that had been occurring previously. Um, but really, if we talk about really achieving full stack observability, we're breaking down a paradigm that's been in place for decades as far as how these teams have worked. So I guess my question to you is, how do you see this working? How do you see full stack observability actually being achieved? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Knowing you, I knew that you're going to hit me with that one. So before you go there, <laughs> let, me, let me try to wrap on the previous one. I do expect full stack observability to become a buzzword. So I do expect people use this just to justify them buying burritos that have more logos on this and something along those lines. <laughs> Did we and just compare full for, stack observability to burritos? <laughs> dude, you can uh, do whatever dead. you want. You're a developer, isn't it? Software, <laughs> come on. You should know that. Nice. My whole point, uh, on, on jokes aside, is that I expect full stack observability to become blast of, of marketing and all of that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it's less about a particular product. And that's to answer your question, the way we are approaching this, Francisco, towards the market and together with analysts and all of our partners is anchor in use cases. Why? Because every customer out there has multiple tools. And there is a lot of tools that are meant to do specific tasks and they're very good on what they do. But what we look at as more that you try to observe, you have more tools than a sprawl. So we are taking the full stack observability approach from an outside in use cases perspective. What is actually the problem that this customer is trying to solve? As opposed to actually what type of new capability or feature I need to put the two X, Y, or Z. So we are getting this from a use case lens. So instead of saying, hey, here's my two products, five products that you need to buy to solve this. Here's the pressing problems. And from those, how are the integrations that needs to exist? And then we start with the integrations amongst different tools to actually fulfill some of these this deliverables and you have them available from Cisco. It's people can consume, buy. But at the same time, you're taking an approach that is data-driven. From that, we are actually looking at telemetry from the lens of metrics that typically aggregates logs and events, which are time-based, and traces, which is mapped to how people consume applications. And ingest all this data, deal with that data ingestion, standardize on open telemetry, which is an area that we are focusing on Cisco very strongly with the community. So we are going after this open source approach for ingestion. And by the time you ingest that data, then you can contextualize find those dependence, data-driven, not tool-driven. So we have that data approach that you can get in. And by doing that, then you can most likely correlate. And by doing correlate, you can potentially drive insights that will recommend you towards actions. Those actions can be on optimize on cost something or right-sizing in a particular environment or handle a security incident, something like that. So a typical example that you see how people can see full stack observability in action. To answer your question on two typical examples rather than one, you just hook my mind. One is, imagine the following, you have an application, whatever that is, that runs on your phone. So that application, the user is you. So you have on your phone, on Android or iOS, doesn't matter. That application may be running 100% on the cloud or on a hybrid environment in your data center. In between you, me, that is a whole internet, because I'm working for home still. So I need to consume that application through my internet connections to whatever it's running. So if that application is not behaving well and my experiences start to go down, the likelihood for me to abandon that app and go somewhere else is very high. So what full stack absorbability does 
is the ability to monitor what the experience for the end user on the phone, map and correlate this with the internet, what's going on in the internet. Is that something that there is an outbreak going on? So should I need to reroute for a different way? All the way back to how does that work on 100% AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or a hybrid environment that you have something in your data center, or any combination of, the, of that so ever. So it's teaching those pieces together, which today belong to the guy that write the code, the application, the guy that is in charge of the infrastructure, guy or girl, that is in charge of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. and the networking mm -hmm. person that is in charge of the internet connectivity. Those are three operation teams that are different today with different tools. Full Stack Observability is teaching this and showing an end-to-end -end view that what I'm monitoring is not a traffic light, green, yellow, or red. What I'm monitoring in and observing, to be honest, is the experience of the end user because that's where the business is getting impacted. So how I can one and the other together. The second example, just to wrap, is one that this, by the way, this internet with the end user and where it runs is one of the top most popular use cases that Cisco on full stack availability provides in our customers consume. Yeah. The second one, which is interesting because it's dear to the heart of developers, but hard for them to deal with, which is the security from the lens of APIs. If you can imagine today, mm -hmm. every developer is going to consume code from open source and Git repos and develop their own things and put on a CI CD pipeline. And the majority of the applications and the code they produce, and sometimes multiple times a day, they may have dependence on external services. And those external services may be an API. So, like you write an app and you give the user an option to log in using Facebook ID, LinkedIn, or something like that. You're consuming an external API for an authentication service. Or you have a payment thing. And your payment needs to talk with Visa, MasterCard, American Express, you name it. You're consuming an external SaaS services. How do we provide observability from the security of those APIs? Because a SaaS provider is not going to give you a note saying, hey, I changed my Leave API, okay. go and change your CIC. That's ain't happening. Right. So we're right. bringing that visibility and correlating this for the API from the lens of security. Is that a rogue API? Is that something that is it shouldn't be there? Is that replicated piece? How is that affecting your code? And, and all of this. So it's an exciting technology domain to be in. It's, as you can see, I'm popped up. It's, we talk <laughs> to all the customers, they all see the problem. And it's, an, it's something that the industry is going gonna, is gonna to adopt and is moving fast. I mean, yeah. clearly, it's a priority for for Cisco. We see that you know every day from you know us talking internally um, to the acquisitions that are happening within Cisco itself, and you know the work that the great work that you and your team are doing. Um, can you tell our snackers a little bit about um, what is actually Cisco doing here, and to to complete that story, the two examples that you said. I just mentioned two examples which materialize two of the seven use cases that we have available in shipping in the market today. So we have seven use cases that are available for customers of ours to consume today. And they pretty much bring together the domains of IT ops, the infrastructure, observability, the network aspect, as I mentioned, the internet, but it's not only the internet, it can be networking on the assets that you own by yourself, like your own data center networking, or your VPCs on public cloud that you buy and is on the on your online, the security operations and the cloud piece plus the applications. So those seven use cases, the other ones is application performance monitoring, traditional ones, hybrid or cloud native ones. We have the observability for SaaS apps. So let's say a lot of customers use Office 365 for their productivity tools, and that's a SaaS thing. You cannot instrument this, but that's part of the employee experience. So mm -hmm. if SharePoint or something, Outlook doesn't work properly, or Google Docs for the people that use that doesn't work properly, those are SaaS, how you can measure that experience. One of the things that we're doing that we are, I believe is differentiated and our customers tell us that, and so does the analyst. We at Cisco, in addition to those, bringing those operations teams together, we have one thing on top of it, which is the business context. And we have this available today. 
The business context can be something as simple as, hey, if let's say you're hit by a mower, hope it never happens, but you're hit by a mower and it, it basically turn, shut down your 20% of your infrastructure because you put them on quarantine. So obviously, if 20% of your infrastructure, regardless of where it runs, let's say on a public cloud, is now on quarantine, you most likely are going to have an imbalance in between supply and demand. You have more customers trying to get rather than what you can provide. So you need to right-size that. So that's the typical IT view. My point here that Cisco has been adding on the full stack observability is when I have this 20% on quarantine, how much that then impact on your business? Is that a million dollars? Is that a $10 million? Kind of thing, because that's a view that the business people see in real time how we recoup or how we are still right sizing, how that's impacting the business at the same time. So that's a very easy for you to map from the monetary value to an impact on infrastructure. So that we map this today, but we are looking and working in other type of customers just to give you an idea. So when I talk with healthcare customers. The business context for them is not the money. The business context to them is how many ICU spots that I have open in a hospital. Do I have those doctors on the right specialization there? Because honestly, if an ambulance goes to and hits that, that's the most important business context, if you will, for them. The money is going to come from insurance eventually at some point. Same thing in other business like gaming. I talk with a lot of gaming studios on observability, and the most important things for them is surely is turn on the game because the games are free to play initially. So it's like not necessarily the business context has to do with monetary value all the time, even though it tends to be that typical rational. So we are expanding the scope of observability to that business contextualization. It's very important. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And actually, I wish we could keep talking about this because I have a, a ton more questions. But unfortunately, um, that is all the time we have for today. But before we let you go, Carlos, uh, we ask this of all our new guests. Um, what superpower would you choose to have and why? Okay, you got to love to be a newbie here. So <laughs> what's the superpower? What's the superpower we wish to have? I would wish to have unlimited wisdom. Oh, okay. The reason is... Like if I mimic what Solomon asked God back in the day in the Bible, it, it, it pretty went well to him. So having a limited wisdom would allow me to help others to see how stuff needs to go together and avoid a lot of mistakes that comes just for our own stupidity sometimes. So that would be a superpower I'd wish to have if that, if, if that addresses your question. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, and actually ties nicely to your to your job role in as a yeah. chief architect at Cisco. So, uh, thank you, Carlos, again for joining us. Uh, Snackers, thank you for uh, joining us again for another episode, and catch us next week for uh, the next DevNet Snack Minute. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Have a good one.